So you're all welcome to tonight's lecture, the first of the season for Tallaght Historical Society and our speaker tonight is Chris Flood who will speak on the subject of Tallaght in transition from ancient to modern. Uh, Chris was a local representative for the area for, for many years as a councillor and TD. I'm sure he has a lot of very interesting things to tell us about the development of Tallaght. So, We saw the advertisement in the back of the evening press, place called Tala, where houses were being uh, advertised and mortgages guaranteed. So we headed out for this place called Tala, which we never heard of before, never knew, found our way up the Green Hills Road uh, into uh, Kildamana Estate, where houses were being built by Brendan McGowan, into the show house. Well, there was about 1,700 houses built in Kildamana in different sections over the following uh, few years. But uh, we knew so little about buying a house at the time that we went into the show house and there was a gentleman sitting beside behind the desk. Uh, he happened to be a retired teacher from our mines, we discovered. But he was doing this on a Saturday and a Sunday and we arrived on the Sunday. And he was uh, in the show house managing the <coughs> individuals who came seeking to purchase a house. So he went to the wall with a very large map of Kildaman Estate, 1700 houses, all laid out in the various sections, uh, Tamaris, Kildaman, um, Park Hill, uh, Elm Castle, Birchville, and all the rest of it. And he just, with his pen, went along the line of us. And when he ran out of red dots, the next vacant uh, square, he said, that will be your house. And that's all we knew at the time about buying a house. And we accepted absolute and we didn't know whether you should ask, is it an end house? Has it a big garden? Is it terrace? Is it semi-detached? Is it detached? Is it near a laneway? All of those things that you might have grown familiar with over the years. But that was our house. That's the point. That's the house we took and risk uh, uh, Tamar Stone. Of course then, that was 1973, then we began to, 74, then we began to come out every other Sunday to try and find our way across the fields, over the hedges and so on, to try and find the location of our site and watch the house as it gradually built up, very anxious as we were to move into the house. And there were countless others doing the very same journey over a period of time. So I'm only just recounting that to you because I know that that was the experience of, of literally of thousands of other people eh, who were coming to live in town. And that was our first introduction to this place eh, eh, that we came to know and to love, eh, Talat. Just in terms, therefore, of, of what was happening in town at that time, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, but particularly the 70s and the 80s, uh, it began to grow rapidly through private house building, through the building of local authority houses by Dublin County Council and through the building of local authorities by Dublin City Council or Dublin Corporation as it was then. So you have three major streams of house building going on at the same time. So you can imagine the level of house building activity that was, that was uh, 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 underway at that time. So what you have to uh, possibly imagine uh, uh, at the moment is that there were hundreds and hundreds of new starter families making their way out to Tallaght uh, and moving into their own house. And of course, house, of course they were confronted with all the uh, difficulties and lack of infrastructure, lack of development and work. But I'm not going into that because other people have spoken at length about that, public representative and all the rest of it, and I don't need to repeat that. Again, I want to talk about the experience of individuals who chose to come uh, and uh, uh, to live in Tallaght and the reasons uh, uh, why they might have come. So, if you take uh, Kildare Manor or Kingswood or Tymon, of hundreds, in some cases, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, 1,800 houses. And almost at the same time, you could have 100 or 200 new starter families moving into those houses uh, and all the challenges that that was going to bring to them, and it did. And the private sector, and the no particular order, the private sector, Dublin County Council, and Dublin Corporation. Now, 
I'll come back to government cooperation uh, uh, later on to the social uh, outcome of their developing houses in the Greater Tall area. Because the Dublin Corporation, uh, uh, prior to that, had got permission from the government of the day to look outside their own administrative area, to be able to come into the county, into the next county, really, County Dublin, uh, uh, to acquire land and to build houses so that they could accommodate individuals and uh, uh, families and groups and so on who were on their housing list in the city area. The net effect of that, of course, is that tremendous number of families were transplanted because they had severe and critical housing needs from the city centre area out to the county. And that's how it was that uh, estates like, for example, Kill and Arden, like the uh, Ballbrook, Avonmore, Avon Bay, Home Lawn, St. Dominic's, had uh, came to be built, uh, Jobstown, and, 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 and all of that direction, uh, Rossfield, uh, Brookfield, and so on. There was a problem, and this is a social uh, problem that confronted people who came from the inner city, or many people. Many of you will know that there were very strong family structures in the city area, difficult and all as their accommodation it was at the time and over generations prior to that. Uh, but there were strong family support, extended family support. Uh, and that was available to as, as, as uh, you know, sons and daughters and so on. Uh, they, then they grew up in those areas, they started the, married and started the families in those inner city areas. They had all the old family generational structural support available to them when difficulty arose or whenever uh, uh, situations arose in which they needed the support of the wider family. Of course, when they came to Tala, that was broken. It was a byproduct, unforeseen, I think, at the time, by the professionals who did this kind of unforeseen that that family structure, that family bond, was broken. And so when the crisis arose for that young family, the young mother with her children, uh, uh, in the Great Italian area, there was a distance, badly served by transport, between where they lived in whatever estate you would like to choose of Dublin City Council uh, in the uh, county area, in the Greater Catholic area. Uh, that was a real significant social problem that it would appear from what I uh, read was not foreseen uh, uh, at the time. And also, of course, Dublin City Council, there was no incentive on Dublin City Council, the administrators, and with respect, the elected representatives on Dublin City Council to spend their uh, uh, short their short resources or their meager resources out in the county, because there was no significant return for the local authority, the Dublin City Council, for that expenditure. So we always had difficulties uh, in trying to persuade a city council to come to the county coming to TAL and to meet its responsibilities uh, insofar as their housing was concerned. Now, of course, I'm not saying the county council is blameless either, or indeed the private sector, which, which, which is certainly, uh, you know, can be blamed for many, many particular issues. So, therefore, uh, a very significant numbers were coming to live in TAL under the different streams uh, of accommodation. Uh, and that's essentially how the various estates were developed because Tyler was developed essentially a state by a state. Sometimes the states going up at the one time, obviously housing the states. Uh, but the, 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 the development was, was proceeding at a ferocious pace. Now, uh, into that mix, of course, came uh, various issues to confront these fledgling communities. Uh, found it difficult to put down permanent roots and to, and, and, and to develop and to have the sort of supports that an old established community might have from within its own people and its own uh, leadership and community and voluntary leadership. So the first issue uh, that I touch upon tonight would be the issue uh, concerning uh, the illegal drug use. Now, this was something that only took place in the city. Uh, and hadn't found its way out for some time out of this, like Talat and Dogger and so on. But eventually it did happen. 
There was a criticism of the city council in this, that sometimes when they found it necessary to take back a house, one of their housing units in the inner city from someone who was maybe convicted of dealing in drugs and all the rest of it, uh, but still were entitled to housing, they were oftentimes housed in the county area uh, in Tala and parts of Pondogan as well. That was uh, an occurrence that drew a lot of criticism from local communities here and a lot of ill feeling towards uh, uh, the city council. In any event, the drugs issue arrived in town with a bang. There were plenty of warnings that it was happening, it was going to happen, and it developed uh, uh, you know, through the late 70s and certainly through the 80s uh, and so on. And that was uh, the cause of very significant social upheaval in town. Uh, apart from the individuals who got drawn into the the use of illegal drugs and all that that meant for themselves and their life, and the family involvement and the families drawn into it and all the rest of it. Um, local communities became seriously impatient with the ability of the state to respond to their needs to protect communities, to deal with the menace of drug uh, uh, abuse and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, they began to take the law into their own hands. Now, this is where uh, it tended to turn a bit ugly in the 80s, if you remember. Uh, you know, communities felt it necessary to block the members of their state into their estates. Uh, communities felt it necessary to march on individual houses. And while there might be an individual dealer in the house, there was oftentimes a partner, vulnerable, and children, vulnerable. And it just was a very difficult and tragic situation for many people caught up in either a user in a house where there was uh, this type of activity uh, going on. So, the state it was very slow really to respond to this particular issue. But you might recall uh, that uh, in the 80s there was a family and with respect to them they would have been known as the Dunn family. And uh, you know, a number of them got themselves involved in in this, in this area and so on, uh, um, but uh, one of them famously said when eventually the, the Gardaí got on top of that situation and put a number of dealers and so on of that particular name, uh, uh, got convictions and they were taken out of circulation as it were, uh, but one of those individuals famously said, well if you uh, if you think what's happening now is bad, where do you see what's coming after us? And what came after them, of course, was the widespread use of the full range of hard drugs and also the various uh, criminalities that you see now, shootings that are almost, almost taken for granted and sometimes generate not a great deal of sympathy, rightly or wrong. So, uh, and that's what we were confronted with Tala, the community uh, of Tala were confronted with that situation. And uh, to be honest with you, as I said, the state did not uh, respond uh, quickly enough. Until, uh, to his eternal credit, in 1996, the then Minister of State, Pat Rabbit, developed this uh, uh, response that if you were going to tackle this drug menace, you had to involve the local community. There was no point in bringing health boards out to tell, tell communities how to, how to deal with it and what to do and so on. So the National Drug Strategy was developed, local drugs task forces, of which was one in Tanna, was developed, uh, but they were owned and managed by the individual communities affected by themselves. And that was a very significant state response to uh, the use of illegal drugs in Tanna. And since then, of course, that has developed, you have treatment centres and people who are in need of assistance and support, they get it uh, and they, they, they have access to the services and so on. And that really is as it should be. And in fairness to the community in Tallinn, when other communities were in denial and saying that there was no need for a treatment centre in their area, no need for those services in those areas, the people of Tallinn generally said, we have a problem, it's within our community, we will tackle it if we're given the resources and the uh, uh, and that's what happened. And various ministers, including myself, 
uh, and carried on with what was started by, by Pat Rabbit. And in fairness, he's, he's to be credited with that very significant initiative. So things have moved on in that area, and while it's, the use is still going on, nevertheless, there are plenty of services there for people uh, uh, who require it. So you have drug treatment centres, for example, uh, in Time and North. Uh, you have it in, uh, in Milbrook Lawns, Chase and Milbrook Lawns. You have it in uh, Hill and Arden, proper treatment centres, modern treatment centres, so that. and you have it uh, uh, in Fettigarin uh, and in Georgetown. The next issue that I think we should uh, touch on, I'd like to, to raise with you, is the question of housing policy. Well, the housing policy in the 1980s, if you were a resident of a local authority house, there was generally in place a tenant purchase scheme. So if you wanted to exercise the desire that most Irish people uh, have had and had at that time to own your own home, then, and if you were living in a local authority house, there was provision under the tenant purchase scheme to, to begin acquiring the house in which you lived in, the local authority house in which you lived in. And that was fine. And many individuals uh, so active bought the local authority in which they were living in, whatever the estate was, and remained there for some, some for all time, some uh, for a very long time. But there was a, a local authority housing shortage in the middle 1980s, which had a, a significant impact on government policy of the day. So what the government of the day decided to do was that uh, since there wasn't the resources at that time to build sufficient local authority houses, that they would, uh, no, they would not renew the tenant purchase scheme, which usually ran out every two or three years. They wouldn't renew a scheme, so the scheme left and you couldn't buy your own local authority house. But what they did was they put in place a grant of £5,000 a which meant if you were living in a local authority house and you wanted to exercise the desire to own your own home, you couldn't buy the house you were living in, but if you moved off and bought a house in the private sector, you would get a grant of £5,000. And it proved very popular. A tremendous number of people who were in employment no, exercising their desire to own their own home, uh, took advantage of the scheme and moved out of the community in which they lived, which was the local authority housing estate. Another unforeseen byproduct of that particular uh, policy was this. When the individual moved to buy their own house in the private sector, they, they they had to have a job, so they were in employment. The problem was that unemployment was growing at the time, and they were replaced by people who were unemployed and who were unable to provide their own house. With the result that local authority estates turned from estates maybe that might have 20 or 25 percent unemployment, I don't have the figures, but they would have significant unemployment, but there would be a significant number of people also working in those estates. Uh, the people with jobs moved off to the private sector, replaced by unemployed. Therefore, unfortunately, for the community, two things happened. First of all, the community unfortunately became a community that was largely unemployed. And that had big social consequences for that community itself. But uh, secondly, a lot of the community leaders, the voluntary uh, uh, leaders of the community, uh, uh, left under that scheme. So for the previous 10 or 15 years, where the community had been patiently building up a good structure from within itself, good community and voluntary leaders, uh, whether they were involving themselves in sporting activities, or organization of sporting activities, social activities, the local church, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and so on. And that left communities devoid of that strong leadership that had grown up from among themselves. So it set those communities back quite significantly in their, in their ongoing development. And that was a significant drawback uh, to the development, to the orderly development of communities uh, uh, within themselves. So it was an example, I suppose, 
of policy that maybe meant well in terms of the provision and helping people to get their own home, <coughs> but didn't work out quite like that. A little bit similar to what happened with, that I've already mentioned about the city council housing their uh, applicants from the city out into the county. The next challenge, major challenge that confronted the new community uh, in Tallinn was the fact that in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, they uh, developed uh, the arrival of very significant numbers of the traveller community. And uh, Ireland was changing at the time, and their old ways were disappearing from the rural lifestyles which they traditionally led up until then. And the services that they provided to rural communities were no longer required. Basic services and crafts that they had were no longer required. So naturally, like us all, or many of us anyway, myself included, uh, they moved to the city uh, looking for opportunities, etc. And Tala became one of the pivotal areas where the conflict, first of all, between the settled uh, the community and the travel community had developed. Now, uh, the question is so, just like I've explained how we came, so many people came to live in Tala, why did the travel community come to live in Tala? Well, they came to Tala because there was so much space available in which they could accommodate their transport, their caravans, whatever, more of a very big number. And this created a lot of tension between developing communities who, who felt themselves to be disadvantaged and, and to not have received from the state appropriate services, facilities on, on the time scale that they expected them to be there. Uh, and the, the travel community came uh, into, into this area as well, as they did in the Gulfin and Bantustan and so on. And the local government simply was not ready uh, for this. And so there was a lot of a lot of difficulties and a lot of tension uh, between certain sections of the settled community uh, and, and the travel community. No program for the provision, no realistic program for the provision of accommodation uh, uh, in, in place for the travel community. As there was for the settled community, because the settled community, uh, you know, there was either uh, you know, low cost private housing or local authority housing for the city council, local authority uh, uh, housing for the county council to meet the needs of their housing applicants. But when it came to the travel, it wasn't in place. That was a problem. Uh, and no provision was made, and very uh, was made. So attempts were made over the next number of years to develop uh, programs. And the problem was every time a site, whether it was for a housing site or group housing, was designated by the local authority to provide that type of accommodation for travelers, there were always very significant uh, local objections, you know, for the reasons that I that I outlined. Uh, so in the middle of 1986, this, this, this situation really came to a head where there were very significant marches and parties uh, led by the settled community against travellers and against the provision of travellers' uh, um, accommodation and so on. And it was getting completely out of hand uh, where the situation was turning uh, very, uh, very, very ugly. Uh, now, my first introduction to well, having come from the country, I knew about travellers and so on and so forth, and how we had lived peacefully beside them, because they had their ways and we had our ways, and that was fine. Um, uh, but when, when the situation came to Dublin, um, and when the, the difficulties arose in the great Italian area, uh, uh, my first introduction to, to, the, to the issue was uh, shortly after being elected to the County Council in 1979, uh, 1980, uh, there was a piece of land at the top of the Manor, which is now called Pine Tree. And that was owned by the local authority because it was cut off from the, the, the road there, it was reserved for, for road development and so on. So it was to the actual road. Anyway, a number of travel families moved in there. I'm just sharing this experience with you because and there was uh, the people of, around the area were not happy about this and they decided to march on the encampment. And there were a number of caravans there, and there were some adult travellers around, 
and there was about 200 of what we would call the second community, and I was among them. But as we marched towards the caravan, uh, looking out the window of one caravan were, were two young children, and uh, they were looking out at this line of 200 adults going towards it. And I think the adults were threatening it, but it would be intimidating. So, when I saw this, I said, this is not the way to do it. And this, this, this ought not to be happening. And so anyway, I, along with many others, uh, uh, we got together and we began to push for the provision of accommodation uh, and so on. And gradually, uh, progress was made, a program for the adoption of, uh, it was adopted in 1986, where there were 15 local electoral areas across Dublin, uh, and each electoral area would take uh, two sites at the time. Uh, and while well, there was a lot of problems about individual sites and so on, but can't speak of the problem I mean, I'm not so sure that a whole lot of the units of the areas that we designated for sites wherever uh, built upon, but be that as it may, uh, a considerable progress has been made since then, and the difficulties that culminated in a meeting at the Catholic Community uh, School, in which there were several hundred outside, and uh, one or two, one particular speaker, a call from the platform that any individual resident who appeared sympathetic to the plight of the travellers, that you were too black at them. And that really brought the whole issue into focus, and I think uh, the wider community of Canada decided that well, that's not necessarily the way to solve this problem. And as it so happens, in the general election of 1982, uh, there was a traveller, Nan Joyce, decided to stand in the election. And there were two other local residents, you know, who were entitled to stand in any ticket they wanted to, but they would be viewed as on the anti traveller ticket. So they went head to head in the general election, and the, the traveller, Nan Joyce, got more votes from the people than did the two, as a traveller, than did the two local residents. So I almost came to the conclusion that when I attended uh, public meetings uh, on the travel issue, you know, the public meeting can be very, can, you know, be very strong. And individuals, certain individuals, can be very articulate from the floor and can bring in attendance with them. I always felt that people of Tallaght when they went home to their own homes and you know, talk about things that we all do, would come to a different conclusion, and that's exactly what happened. And that was borne out. In, in that particular outcome. And in fairness, they were strong enough, they were compassionate enough, and they were caring enough to participate very significantly in showing uh, considerable leadership uh, to dealing with the issue of travel accommodation. And I think that ought to stand to the credit of the community in Tala, who themselves, who found themselves in many cases uh, confronted by, by significant issues uh, of disadvantage. Now, it's not all bad issue, but, uh, uh, about negative issues, but the one final thing I would raise on that, uh, that were confronted the people of Tyler, particularly in the private house, was the whole ground rent issue. Now, if you take Hilna Manor, 1,700 houses, the builder decided that they were going to charge ground rent on every house, every year, to the kingdom. And that would produce ground rent, uh, just calculated and preparing for tonight, of about £40,000 per year at that time. For no particular reason, except that it was possible to impose ground rent. And that created a lot of hassle and a lot of difficulty. And all these families in Kilnamana and Kingswood and Springfield and Belgard uh, and Glenview, uh, all young starter families, and they took the view at that time they were just not going to take this. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the notices would be sent out and we'd all have to go to the court in Kilmena and the court would be jam-packed and there'd be queues outside and all the rest of it. I think in the end it just became uh, unworkable. And so the government of the day decided that from then on any new house would be built, you would not be allowed to have a ground rent element uh, uh, in it. And the rest, the, 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 the remaining grounds, I think, were largely uncollectible. But it was a significant issue uh, at the time and confronted people, as I say, starting out in their own. Now, the, the cohesiveness of the tally unit 
of the Tala sort of, uh, uh, housing area, of the Tala area itself, depended a lot on communication. So we were blessed with a couple of local papers, newspapers, a weekly paper, a monthly paper. I suppose the most eminent of them all being the Tala Echo. Uh, now I'm going to think of the Echo newspaper. Uh, and under the, 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 the stewardship of, of David Kennedy, Tala resident, this was a very unifying uh, uh, newspaper in Tala because you could get the Echo, the Tala Echo there was then, and you could, you could find out what's going on, you could see what's happening, uh, and you could see all the, all the issues and the challenges and the positives and the negatives and so on. And that, as far as I know, has been going there for over 30 years. But it did help to bring the community together. It did highlight issues, and I think it helped to develop a sense of community, because it was the only major communication uh, type document around. Now, there was other papers like the Westside Press, which was a smaller version, really, of the Echo. And uh, there, there, were, there were attempts to establish, uh, on a wide footing, uh, Tala-local radio. It had its ups and downs. Don't think it's ever quite made it, in terms of the minds of the Tala people. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I don't think that, uh, that, is, that it has happened. So that was the way in which, uh, I think, in which the community spirit was largely drawn up uh, in, in, the, in the Tala area. Now, in terms of, of culture and music and sports and so on, well, first of all, we had the Tala Youth Band. That apparently was started in 1978 by Father Len Perham, who was recently deceased, uh, and uh, uh, Paddy Hayden from Bancroft, also Ray Modani from Bancroft, and I and I McKenna. Kind of, they're just names that I'd be familiar with. Uh, but that, the Tally Youth Band comprised 60 young musicians. Very fine band, very finely turned out, pipers and drummers and all the rest of it. Uh, and many of, the, many of those youngsters grew up to become musicians in their own right, including uh, uh, joining the, uh, the army band and the, and the guard band. Uh, but they did participate in, in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in town uh, and other parades around the country. They went abroad, they won prizes and so on and so forth. But they did bring a great deal of, uh, of uh, credibility to town. And I think that they, uh, uh, as well as that, the, the, the leadership of that band um, uh, they were the organisers of the, of the St. Patrick's Day uh, parade. I know uh, uh, Michael Hanrahan, the husband of the person of the Tala uh, Historical Society, he was centrally involved in that for a long number of years, as a deep members of the family. And uh, I mentioned names because I said that's what I want to concentrate on tonight, is the names of individuals and uh, community groups uh, who participated in that. But the Tala Youth Band organised the Tala uh, parade, St. Patrick's Day parade, which was very successful. Uh, and brought a lot of credit uh, to the area, a lot of participation, particularly by local community and voluntary groups. So you could see on St. Patrick's Day, you could see uh, the, the, the depth of community and voluntary activity under, under a variety of headings, uh, which were beginning to mushroom in the Great Italian area. So uh, the youth band certainly played, uh, played its, its part in that, as did the festival band, uh, which was founded, I think, by Pat McNally and others around in 1988. Again, travelled abroad and so on, and brought great credit uh, again uh, 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 to Tallinn. Also, at the back uh, of St Mary's School, at the top of the Greenfields Road, was the little theatre in the hills, Tallinn Theatre, which I think has put on in, in the past as a community theatre, put on wonderful productions. Now it has its own site. And, and a very nice building on the grounds of the uh, Cuckoo's Nest, on grounds given by, uh, 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 by Phyllis Lynch. Uh, 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 and, and they have put on some, some wonderful... Uh, right, I would better hurry on. But we're, we're all right for, for an extra little bit. Okay. Well, I think, I think the people want to stop on this. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, but, but there were a whole range of other uh, activities, like the Athletic Club, uh, which was, you know, which was a combination of three athletic clubs in Tallinn. They all came together, and now they have a very fine club, very fine grounds, and very fine facilities uh, just off the off the off the green as well. So, I suppose as I conclude, there's a, there are a couple of, of other items I would raise. First of all, the Tallinn Institute of Technology. I first heard Father Len Perham say it would be a good idea for such an institute to be located in Tallinn. 
And even though I was a public representative at the time, I just didn't think he was talking seriously. I just didn't think it would happen. But it did. And he was uh, he was the, one, of, one of the original instigators and had the vision uh, to say that. Uh, actually, the first uh, the first uh, chair, chairman of the board there uh, in the Italian Chamber uh, of, of, of the Italian Institute was actually a chap called Tom Clark. Tom was, uh, I think he was the chief in Gallagher's here on Greenhouse Road when I was functioning. And I had I, I had the occasion to sit beside him once or twice at, at events and we were able to chat and talk. And Tom was unashamedly uh, of the Unionist tradition from Northern Ireland. But yet, when he came to Tala, he immersed himself in community and voluntary work uh, in Tala in terms of the Chamber of Commerce and the College and made a tremendous contribution to, to the emerging college and to uh, 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 life in Tallinn at the time. And only quit, he only retired recently and only quit the, the chair recently. That's right. That's right. Some other time. time. Now, the other uh, uh, person I'd just like to mention you know, it would, it would be Kevin Malloy. I mentioned him because he was the first chairman of the Tallinn Hospital Planning Board. And uh, that Obviously, it was something that went back right, in the minds of people. You know, you bring the three city, you bring them out to Tala, you build a new hospital in Tala, you put them on the one campus, and so on. And uh, 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 Kevin uh, was the first chairman of the Tala Hospital Planning Board, which had a very difficult part in that assist because when the campaign uh, to bring that hospital to Tala, uh, what uh, uh, vested interest in in the matter in James's and in uh, Bowman. Uh, were saying, don't be the Tala Hospital. Uh, we have enough room in our hospital. The underlying uh, we, our view that was, they were saying, if you build the Tala Hospital, there'll be no money left for us to do our capital work on our site in St. James's, uh, in the matter, and in Bowman. So it wasn't really for the right reason, so the campaign continued. And in fairness, uh, the campaign was managed and driven by the priests and indeed the Church of Ireland clergy here in Tallaght uh, to bring um, uh, the hospital uh, to Tallaght. Well, it was a question of finance. And if I may just tell you a, a basic story, and I'm not promoting any particular political party or uh, ideology or anything, but anyway, in the late 80s, there were serious difficulties, as you know. Graham McSharry was there with his knife and all the rest of it, and for good or ill, these things were happening. And, uh, something similar was happening then as happens today, maybe for different reasons, but anyway, uh, the hospital was, uh, was, not, was not for going ahead. It was going to cost 120 million. And you remember the cutbacks in the schools and the class sizes and the big meetings and all the rest of it. In any event, as it so happens, uh, there was a presidential election, and you remember the difficulties which arose for the late Prime Minister Senior, and or us and out the wrong phone call and all of that. Any event, um, uh, just before I finish, uh, just to complete this, um, I, I, I was a backbench PD at the time we were in government, and I was called into uh, the Prime Minister's office who told me uh, I'm going to appoint you to the Minister of State, Department of Health. Which I thought, well, this is terrific. We're going to of Health. We're trying to get a hospital in Tala. There's a whole big campaign with strong people pushing that game, not just not me. Uh, 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 at all. Anyway, I was in, and as I left Mr. Hardy's office, which I was in for about one minute to get that at one, he lifted his head up and he said, by the way, that hospital will never be built. Outside the door, I said, that's it, that's, that's the killer, and, and we basically been told, stop campaigning for the hospital. Two years later, uh, Albert Reynolds uh, came to power. And I met him in the corridor, and the first thing he, he said to me was, we're going to build the hospital. And it was a question of finance. In the end of the day, 70 million, 73 million was got from the EU, which never funded hospitals. Uh, that was their policy. The hospital was built. But let me say now, lest anyone have any uh, 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 criticism of the fact, various governments of various hues made significant contributions over the years supporting the local community and building the hospital. So 
wasn't down to one, any one government or any one particular colour or, or other. In any event, the hospital arrived in Canada uh, despite a lot of objections uh, uh, along the way from vested interest outside of the Canada area. There are a lot of other issues and so on that uh, I could go into if I have time. I haven't, so that's not a problem. But I do see in one of the recent editions of the Echo that a group of artists based in Tal are coming together to gather all this sort of information, the type of information that I have, the type of information that any of you probably have as well, your own personal experiences, your own knowledge, and so on. And they're going to be meeting, as far as I know, from now until sometime into November, in a, in a, a port cabin actually on the Fetic uh, and they would uh, welcome people making available to them their own personal reminiscences, experiences, photographs, or anything else. Because I think that before we all head off to wherever we're going to, that we might leave behind with our own personal experiences to be gathered in for future generations here uh, uh, in town. And I certainly would be doing that tonight. So, but I hope it didn't bore you too much. I, I hope I got some information out here that might be interesting and useful to you. And I certainly have enjoyed it immensely coming here at uh, Tom and and to say these few words to you all. And thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. I purchased my house in 1974 in Germany. Right. And I lived here on the first day of the 1975, which was snowing actually in the day I moved in. But the advertisement that they talk about, the, the paper, I can't remember, but I still have the paper at home, something like on your own style, I came up the Green Hills Road too, but on the ad in the paper, it was advertised I was buying the house in Walkhamstown. Oh, <laughs> and that was Brennan on the yeah, ground. Yeah. And I often wondered, you know, and then it ended up, what happened was, way near where the Cooper's nest was, there was a sign there for Tala, and he kept moving it and moving it this way. And people were going it the next day. And then the council, the answer to it that was, the council took the sign completely, and everybody forgot where they lived. That's very true. I noticed you didn't mention uh, the, the square or say Dublin County Council. No, I, I appreciate that in the modern, here. you know, it was in transition and, yeah. and even the library here and immigrants in this new century. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Flood as well, Tala Coral Society, I think, uh, preceded uh, Tala Band, the youth band and everything. And Tala Coral Society, I'm not a member of it, so I yeah. have no axe to grind. But that's brought great credit to Tala because it can fill the concert hall in Dublin from people from all over the uh, city and the, and the country, in fact. And the other thing I would like to mention, Tala Historical Society itself, which, thank God, is still going, um, which was founded by Margaret Taylor, a native of French Park in County Ross Common, who had been a public health nurse in Dublin and she was married to an English man who was a lecturer in Bolton Street Te uh, College of Technology and she founded that society in the early 70s with Canon Alexander yes. as a trustee and she kept the society going nearly one-handed for many years and she's dead a long time now, but I do think uh, that she shouldn't be forgotten. And the other thing is just the original people of Tala, uh, who willingly or otherwise were forced to accept this explosion in their <laughs> lovely, peaceful place from, as you said, a population of 2,000 to 80,000 willy-nilly. And the local doctor, Dr. O'Raven, said he couldn't um, listen to people's chests with his stethoscope when lorries were going, going back up and down the main street. And the people, the original people of Tala, one of whom died recently, Andy Mulvaney, who was the local postman for so long and a wonderful character in Tala, and a lot of those old people are still around and their descendants, and they embraced 
all of us who came in from all over the country and from outside as well. So, just like yeah. that they should get yeah. some mention too. Absolutely. Thank you. No, no, but I must say for my, I'm here 14 years, and for myself, I think a local paper is a terrific strength. But I think precise, you talked about moving out, as we all know, and no facilities. And I think precisely because you had to, the community had to agitate, get organised, etc. There is a terrific strength in that. Now, how we get young people to replace those originals, um, but even to be able to do the Talafest there uh, right. recently. And we have a flower festival coming up at the end of the month, and I've been quite impressed by the, the support and the goodwill, even in these recessionary yeah. times, you know. Um, so I must say, uh, the fact that I'm here 14 years, and I'd, I'd be afraid to leave. <laughs> I'd just like to thank you guys very, very much uh, for that very interesting talk. Yeah, say. yeah. And a great start to the season, I think, a great stimulus uh, to starting off the new season of lectures. Brilliant.